The Secrets of Technology is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to The Secrets of Technology. Hi, I'm Dom Bettinelli, and you're listening to The Secrets of Technology, where we discuss the technology news that's important to you from a uniquely Catholic point of view. And joining me today on the panel are Father Corey Stika. Hi, Father Corey. How's it going? Very well, thanks. And Joanne Mercier. Hi, Joanne. Hi, Dom. Folks, I want to tell you about another show on the network you are sure to enjoy called Raising the Bets. You can find it wherever fine podcasts are found or at sqpn.com slash B-E-T-T-S. So let's talk about some of the big news. And so the big headline in tech news lately, especially tech news that's right in our wheelhouse, has to do Mm -hmm. with Google's AI that has reportedly become self-aware and has a soul, at least according to one engineer who has since been suspended from his job. So this Google engineer named Blake Lemoyne works in the, uh, on AI, their AI projects. And he says, and he says he's a Christian and f- is approaching this from his uh, faith point of view, his faith perspective. Mm. And he says that this AI called Lambda, uh, I forget what it stands for, language model for dialogue applications, rolls off the tongues. Uh, yes. So it, it it has, he says it has become self-aware and that it has a soul and that it should have its own legal representation. And he, he <laughs> has this blog post that he wrote where he talked about uh, all of the various uh, conversations he had with it. And that has started this huge conversation about AI sentience. Can, can, can AIs have a soul? And and then further on, people saying, well, is this really a distraction from the real issues of having to do with AI uh, b- about other problems that can be can result from artificial intelligence? So just I want to start with like your first take on this question and what's going on with this. What is your first impression on this? I don't know what to say half the time. <laughs> OK, <laughs> let's put it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's it's uh, it's troubling and interesting at the same time. I'm not sure we're smart enough as human beings to create something that has its own purpose and understanding and can, you know, be like us. I don't think we have that. At the same time, we we are we are smart enough to produce something like that and let other people think that could be real, which will get us in just as much trouble as if it were. Right. Right. So I'm my my concern is sometimes we we're too smart for our own good, as my mother would say. Yeah, that's the that's one of the things that comes up with this with me is 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 have we tricked ourselves into thinking that uh, a it, something that's essentially a very smart program is actually conversing with us and actually has a personality. Is it a kind of pareidolia where we're assigning a, uh, intelligence to just something that's a very sophisticated pattern matching system? Mm. Uh, what do you think, Father Corey? You know, I, I like to ask those, does it dream of electric sheep? <laughs> for those who don't oh. know, for those who don't know, the the original book that produced, that became the Blade Runner movie was called Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? by right. Philip Philip K Dick. And I mean that's kind of part of the idea of it, you know, are they these these devices, these you know androids, are they really uh self-aware? And that that's that's been kind of the used to the term kind of loosely, but holy grail of, you know, computer AI research is to develop an AI that is self-aware. And and I I think unfortunately the the two issues are self-aware and have a soul. You know, I think those are two separate things when we're talking about something that is essentially a massive data gathering and and sorting program. It's able to take this. This Lambda is able to take, you know, data from thousands and millions and billions of websites and posts and comments and all these things and collate them into what seems like a human response. 
But does that make itself aware? Does that make it aware of itself? Or is it able to take, you know, you, you look at some of the, the, the comments that, that he had, or the questions he had asked it, and it talks about, you know, having a girlfriend in Canada. Well, as, as like the author of one of the article puts, everybody at some point in their life when they were trying not to be a dweeb <laughs> said they had a girlfriend in somewhere else like right. Canada. Uh, you like know, the so summer camp. Yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, and it, it's so many of the these the things that it could be getting back as a response could just be, oh, I see a question like this and this is how it's commonly re- answered. Well, and all it is is just being smart at searching than well, it is actually having an awareness of its own. Right. Does a parrot, if a parrot can say, you know, uh, uh, you know, Polly want a cracker, doesn't mean that it's actually a smart, you know, sentient, mm-hmm. intelligent being. It's just, it, it knows how to make certain noises that elicit a response from us. And that's kind right. of what this is doing is, is it, mm-hmm. it's, it's knows how to make noises that elicit a response. And I think part of the problem is, as you kind of point out, Father Corey, is we've had so much science fiction, which looks at this holy grail of sentience as, you know, for AI. I think that we're, we're hyped to see it wherever we, wherever right. it's possible. Whereas it's not necessarily, that's, that's not, shouldn't necessarily be the end game for, for the, for, you know, smart computers is, is this being able to be like a human being, but it also, it's just, just because it can give responses that, we're looking for. I think uh, mm-hmm. I saw. I think it was uh, J.D. Flynn over at Pillar Catholic who was saying, you right. know, just just because it tells us things that we want, the, the things we want to hear, doesn't make it intelligent. Like there are plenty of ways where it's not doing things that you would expect a human response to be. It has, you know, when you sit down with a human being and have a cup of coffee and you have a conversation that conversation goes all over the place they have all kinds of emotions as all whereas the conversations with this it's clearly trying to give you this responses that you want and there was there was a program back in the 60s called eliza i mean this is early computing yeah and it actually was able to fool people into thinking that was a human on the other side of the teletype or whatever you know the terminal right and it was just a program that all it did was figure out how to do pattern matching yeah mm. and it could it could figure out you ask a question it could figure out an answer that could answer that and of course you know it was a very primitive compared to this lambda but it still was able to at least at first glance make people think they were talking to another human and so this isn't something new it's just, of course, our technology has advanced so much more in the 60 years since that came out that now they've got the horsepower to make it really powerful and really good at making those pattern matchings and making the connections and doing the searches and so on. Now, say it really was, you brought up a good point too, say it really was something beyond pattern matching and algorithms and really was aware of itself. That still raises the question of, does is it a person? Does it have a soul? Mm-hmm. And I think even if it's, you know, even like I think it's Jimmy Aiken uh, office says on Secrets of Star Trek, Data's just a sophisticated toaster. He has, mm-hmm. you know, it, it's he's still a machine. He's still not a person, no matter what they say in the show. Right. right. Because someone is responsible for the programming. A human being is responsible for this programming. And a human being is a limited, you know, right. person. I mean, it's a limited mm-hmm. limit person, but it's a limited being you know we only know so much and we only give it what we know we can we can tell it to match all of this stuff we can put it out on google and say suck all that info in you know we can say match all of this and and but we don't really give it a chance it can't choose in reality unless it's in its programming right in order for it to choose the counter argument that you hear sometimes is, well, we create human beings, we, we create children, and we, we give them their knowledge and understanding. But that's not really what happens with, like a child, no. even if, even if remo- like horrifically removed from parents and not given any human contact, is still basic, uh, going to have a basic set of mm-hmm. understanding, instruction right. set, if you want to use a computer term, that is in there fr- innately from birth, like, given by God and the, so that it's different. And the big thing is, is there is no inner life 
to this. That, and that's really the key here for whether a person or sentient is a true inner life, a true inner understanding of self, of the universe, my place in the universe, a thought, uh, my interactions with others. There is no mm -hmm. inner life in any of these things, and it can't be. And in a human, I want to say that that type of of response or awareness is nurtured rather than given the right, information. Right. Okay, yes. it's nurtured. We nurture human beings. If you watch, I mean, I recently have experienced watching the death of a family member. It's that we as humans are the most unique, yeah, being right. on the planet. Okay, somebody else made us. Right. Mm -hmm. We make these devices. And what kills me is when I hear, especially little kids, reacting to the A-Lady or to Shlomo mm -hmm. um, and, a, and a parent not saying, you don't have to say that. Because now they're interacting with this machine right. and giving yep. it the prominence as you, as you would another adult. Yeah, there's, I think we've talked about it before, like, to, to, should you be polite to the automated, you know, lady in a box, uh, you know, whether it's your phone or the the echo or whatever. And, you know, on the one hand, the argument is, is be polite f as a modeling for children uh, or, or just don't be polite because they don't need, you don't need to be polite right. to it, you know? Right. And, and that's really the, because it, because being treating it like a person creates a false understanding of what that thing is. And I think this, there's a little bit of truth in both of those things, but one of the, the important points that, that some of the AI ethicists bring out, in this uh, uh, various articles that uh, we'll link to is the danger of the AI of treating the AI like um, making AI sentience too important mm -hmm. in the, the Turing test, the whole idea of, you know, sh should it, should it be able to trick a human being and, and someone pointing out, so you, your test for sentience is essentially founded on deception that it can trick you into yeah. thinking it is something it isn't. And, and really that is problematic. And there are, and it, it, this sort of sentience discussion distracts from a lot of other questions having to surrounding AI or machine learning, whatever you want uh, questions of justice, of whether these things are inherently biased based on the data sets they imbibe and all sorts of things like that. Well, I was, I was thinking animals by nature will learn to survive in general. You know, they learn what they need to survive. This machine can't. This machine cannot learn what it needs to survive because. Yes. There's just nothing you can do. There's nothing. If you took this device and put it on an empty room with no Internet connection, it's not going to learn anything mm -hmm. at all. It's not going to have that. Like you talk about, Joanne, the innate, you know, just survival instincts. And if you turn that machine off, there is nothing it can do about it. It won't even know that it had been turned off. Right. You know, and it, it's, it's really, it, it's looking at sentience, again, going back to data as the measure of a man episode of Star Trek, you know, the whole trial that he is, you know, that yes, he is a sentient, sentient being and must be treated that way instead of just a toaster. Right. Right. But, but let's be honest, he is, as Jimmy says, he is just a fancy toaster. What worries me is this gentleman, I guess, I, I mean, I, I'm, I fear for him because I'm not sure what world he's living in at the present moment, if he believes that this has become a sentient mm -hmm. device or being, you know, that, that scares me because if he, a, a learned person, can do that, what about the rest of the people? Right, right. That is, that is the problem is what if you think it's a person what are you what kind of steps are you going to take if you feel attachments emotional attachments mm -hmm. too you know him and other people will we start to follow ais as leaders will we start to attribute religious sentiment toward them uh there's as this guy does as yeah. this guy does um yeah he says that he's a priest of some religious organization by the way this guy um i'm not sure what church he belongs to uh he says i'm a priest when lambda claimed to have a soul and then was able to eloquently explain what it meant by that i was inclined to give it the benefit of the doubt who am i to tell god where he can and can't put souls 
Well, then put one in my dog because my dog is <laughs> <laughs> deserves well, one more than an inanimate object. Well, but the thing is, is does it talk about having a soul because of who it's talking to? You know, that's the thing is, I mean, do, you know, were you leading the witness? So it's, it's mm-hmm. all, it's all very interesting uh, in an abstract sense. There's a concrete question about whether this is problematic, this whole line. Uh, and I think it's something we need to deal with philosophically and theologically. We need to really approach this subject and start talking about it as, as Christians, as a church, because it's going to only become more important and more, more present. And we don't want to be playing catch up down the road with this whole issue. I think we need to get out in front of it right now. Absolutely. Now, I would agree with you because this is what our, the people in our assemblies are going to be looking at and right. encountering. And we should know, we should start giving them a little bit of clue on, you know, this really isn't real. Right. And you most know, people but, are going to only be hearing the nightly news or the daily papers version of this, which is usually very lacking in context and in nuance. And, and so they're going to, Sure, I love data. I love, you know, Wally. Why not? You know, mm-hmm. it's like, okay, we need to, we really need to take a step back and approach this from first principles and, you know, uh, with the context. When we already have people who, let's be honest, they, they treat their animals as if they're people. I mean, they treat their dogs, you know, their pets. Like children, yeah. Like children. I do not. But they, <laughs> yeah, good. No, but it, it's, it really is a, a problem today that we don't understand what personhood means, what it means to be a human person mm. right. and what it means to have sentient, to be sentient. And they don't, something like this is just going to make things worse when, when they're yeah. saying, oh, now mm. this computer program, which, I mean, let's be honest, that's what Lambda is. Right. It is a computer program or a series of computer programs that works together to provide a response that sounds like it's human, you know, it's responding as a human being. Right. And to quote, I want to like a quote from J.D. Flynn's article that he did on Pillar Catholic, where he says, uh, we also know that personhood is not defined by consciousness, sentience, or self-awareness, much less by code generated to the, the, by code generated claims to those things. And it's really important that we get better explaining that because baked into the idea that a chatbot might be a person because it claims to be self-aware or to have desires or to have feelings is the implicit argument that an unborn baby is not human because it lacks those things, just like mm-hmm. a severely disabled man or like grandma suffering from dementia, right? Personhood is not defined by sentience or consciousness. It is defined right. by the reality of who we are created to be. That's what defines personhood. And so that's why it, it, JD says, and I, I, I think I agree, this is really an argument about, and fundamentally about personhood and abortion and euthanasia uh, mm-hmm. as much as it is about AI and computer and technology stuff. Well, we've already got vehicles on the road that have artificial intelligence. Tesla makes them. Right. You know, mm-hmm. all the other manufacturers have similar products. And it's at what point are they going to say, well, now, the, now Teslas are, are self-aware vehicles and so they get to choose whether you get to go or not or they get to to choose where where what's going to happen or yeah fundamentally choosing things like the trolley problem uh you know does it there's a it's going to crash there's a a group of people here and a woman pushing a a baby carriage over there who does it crash into the group of many people or this or the baby carriage and that's a decision that a human being has to make in a split second using all ethical means, how do we, how do we program an AI to make an ethical choice like that or a moral choice like that? That's the, that, I don't think I, we are ever going to be a point where we can be comfortable right. with that sort of thing. Well, there were stories when Tesla first came out that, and I don't know if it's still an issue now, you know, years later and many revisions of their AI later, but where the Tesla would hit an emergency vehicle because it was the choice of the emergency crew working on somebody on the side of the road or the vehicle right in front of it. So they hit the vehicle. Right. Ooh. As opposed to doing something besides those two things. Yeah. Right. 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 Um, so stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's an important subject that 
you know, it, it can admit to a lot of like silly talk, you know, and it's, it's, it's fun to kind of be silly about the such things, but there are important questions about this sort of thing long-term for us as a society and what we're willing to, yes. to accept and what, and what we should allow as a society. And we are at that point in our development as a society and culture, a civilization where we can do things that we ought not to do in, in technology. That technology mm-hmm. gives us the ability to do all kinds of amazing things that are simply not right, immoral, unethical. Uh, and one of those might be making AIs into pretending that there's something that they're not and pretending right. that pres- you know, they have personhood. Well, and there's so much good that can come from AI. I mean, we, again, we, we see it with self-driving cars. We see it with, right. with the search results you get when you go to Google. We see all the, you know, all these, you know, AI can help businesses be more efficient. It can help, you know, It'll all these diagnosing things. Diagnosing illnesses, obscure illnesses, yeah. and all kinds of things like that. Yeah. Machine learning, the pattern matching, sophisticated algorithms, artificial intelligence, whatever we call it, is a powerful, powerful tool that should be recognized as an as a object, as a tool, not a subject or a person, and that's right. the key difference. Uh, we need to we need to stay aware of that, and I I think that's going to be an issue for us as a society because frankly we have a hard time figuring out that people are persons. So yeah. <laughs> so anyway, uh, we'll yeah we'll keep following this. It's an interesting subject. To, I'm sure there'll be more about this as we go along. Uh, Joanne, did you have a now thought, I was going to say, and all of this is just a distraction, mm-hmm. right? Right. You know, there are there are more. There are lots of other things in life we human beings need to be concerned with. All of this is distraction. Well, there are a lot of tech issues that, especially including issues surrounding AI and ML and machine language, uh, machine learning. Sorry, that we need to be addressing. That this mm. distracts from too. And you're right. Yeah, and that has come up in several of the articles that I'm going to link to. Is that this sort of circus distracts from real concerns that we should be having about the ethics mm-hmm. of AI. Yeah, definitely. All right, let's move on. And uh, before we get to our headlines, there are some real persons I want to <laughs> mention <laughs> and thank. Those are our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secrets of technology, including Michael G, Robert H, Terry F, Mary S, and Justin S., their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue the secrets of technology and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. So uh, f- for our first headline is another one that's uh, related to stuff that's been in the news a lot. This is a uh, headline is U.S. TikTok user data has been repeatedly ac- accessed from China, leaked audio shows. And so the story is that going back a few years when TikTok came to the U.S., it was a big controversy because TikTok is owned by a company called ByteDance. And ByteDance is a Chinese company with ties to the Chinese Communist government, as all Chinese uh, companies do at one level or another. The Communist Party has its fingers in everything in China. And so there was concern that this social media app would be getting its uh, hooks into people's information and, and, and it's not only getting information, but also manipulating because these algorithms about what they shows us manipulating the public by uh, changing what we see and and, and that sort of stuff to the point even where president Trump tried to ban TikTok in the U S and that caused a big, to do and and resulted in promises from TikTok and ByteDance that the U.S. owned wholly owned subsidiary would be very separate, would keep our data separate from China and not accessed in China. Well, it turns out that was kind of a lie, <laughs> according <laughs> to this article. Kind of, kind of a lie, according to this article. And in fact, uh, a, a lot of information that TikTok can uh, can has can only be accessed by certain high level users in China. Uh, and there's all other concerns as well, but first, like just, I want to get your reactions to the, to the story so far uh, on this. I'm, this is the reason why I don't have TikTok. Right. I mean, mm-hmm. it, they, when you see a lot of kerfuffle, I'll use that word around an app, then I don't want to use it because I have enough problems with Facebook to begin with. Or Twitter, mm-hmm, right. you know, I've already seen what those two can do. I'm not about to jump on this bandwagon. 
But again, any of the, we should understand any time we use any of these things that are free, there mm-hmm. is a price to be paid and it's our data. So, okay, if I'm using f- Facebook or Twitter, I know my data is going to get accessed by somebody. I hope it's a friendly government. Um, other than that, I have no other expectation. And that's why I don't use a lot of them. Right. But all you need is one to spread it to everybody else. So why we think we're, we're trying to play this game of being private when we're all out there on the internet is beyond me. Right. Yeah, and in how, what kind of data does TikTok collect? Obviously, things like location data, you know, it's got your recordings, but it, I'm sure it's pulling other data. I'm sure it's pulling lots of data just off your phone, just off your location, you know, everything that you've got. And China has access to all of that. And that, that actually has been a problem uh, for the military because they talk about OPSEC, operational security. You know, the, it, it, the stereotype was when you told someone you were going, you know, deploying overseas, it's to a, you know, undisclosed location, you know, going to an undisclosed location. It kind of became a joke. But part of that was you really couldn't, you did not want to tell people as you're getting ready to go on a plane that, yeah, I'm flying over to Saudi Arabia. I'm flying over to, Mm, you know, these different locations so that they knew what troop movement was doing and so on. Right. You know, that those who would be listening in place like China and Russia and so on. And, Something like TikTok is just leaking data to to the Chinese and most of the data they're going to get. It's just going to give them information about the average American, shall we say. But there's going to be a lot of stuff that they can mine out of that data can that can tell things like troop movements, like uh, where are our strengths, where are our weaknesses as far as defense are concerned, government officials, various infrastructure. Yes. I mean, we actually saw that uh, not that long ago here in the church where uh, I believe it was Pillar who was able to get a hold of some Tinder data. And there were a bunch of celibates in the uh, Vatican who were using Tinder. Right. Or there was the Uh, uh, secretary general of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops who was using Grindr, which is an app for men Mm -hmm. to meet other men. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's, that actually was the app. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was. So, I mean, that shows what you can do with this data. No, you might mm-hmm. not be able to just look at the data and say, OK, I know exactly who this person is. I know exactly where they are. I know exactly what they're doing. But then I can combine it with this data and that data and this other section. All of a sudden, I've got a full picture of this person. Uh, this this well, uh, if the social. Like- del- oh, sorry. Go, it's okay. Go ahead. Finish. I was going to say the social dilemma really yeah. showed that well, that they can take all this data and put it together and get a full picture of you, or at least a pretty reasonable picture of you. The next Netflix documentary, Social Dilemma. Yeah. Mm. Go well, ahead, I'm, I'm sure I'm putting somebody to sleep because my life is so boring that <laughs> I'm sure I'm putting some, I, I hope I'm putting somebody to sleep. Well, there was that scandal in out of Canada recently uh, where Tim Hortons, which is the, the big uh, coffee chain in Canada, what their app what turned out was harvesting all kinds of location data on its on people who had the app installed, including when you when you would and where your where your home is, when you would leave it, when you would arrive at work, what other coffee places you were going to, all kinds of information that they shouldn't be accessing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It was a huge uh, scandal there, uh, and and that's the sort of thing. Is is like we give location permissions, like. We can, you know, the the phone companies, the Google and Apple, can lock down this stuff to require permissions, but we give the permissions in order to use the app. Like I, I have to give it like location data in order for it to work, and and so that's when they start harvesting all this extra data. It's not granular enough to say only use it for the very specific, you know, TikTok data that you want to do. But harvesting that data is only part of it. That's the, the you know, the birthdays and phone numbers and that sort of stuff. There's also the soft concerns, which is um, to, where was it? The the soft power of the Chinese government that could have ByteDance executives direct their American counterparts to adjust the levers of mm. TikTok's algorithm, is, as the article says, which recommends videos to its more than 1 billion users. So, for example, if you want to really influence people and you start pushing more and more uh pro maga or pro biden stuff or the the fringe views start pushing fringe extreme left or extreme right views to to people you can 
you can gin up dissent and outrage in the United States and distract us, you know, that way. Uh, it's and they can do that just by. And we've seen that. We've seen that Facebook did that. We, you know, the leaked information from them and these studies about how they could affect what people's mental health by the mm-hmm. sorts of posts that they showed them. So this is the sort of thing we need to really be concerned with uh, that if other for, if foreign powers have the power, have the ability to really do this on the most po- it's the most popular social media app in the world now, which is kind of yeah. scary. Well, and yeah. thing too is they can use these apps to promote themselves as well. I don't know if you've seen it, but on YouTube, every once in a while, it'll pop up a, my visit to North Korea or my visit to Beijing. And it will be some American who gets permission to go and film in these countries. Yep. And of course it's glowing. It's, Oh, it's so wonderful here. And there's the people are so friendly and generous and the food is so great. And I mean, they're treated like rock stars. Well, yeah. Cause the, you know, and they can the use stuff like that the tree is usually the one that's paying. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, but they can use stuff like that in some like in TikTok to make sure that there are TikToks that every once in a while just show up talking about how great China is, how wonderful it is to live there, how wonderful the people are, and so on. And it just kind of part of their, you know, they get somebody talking in their car, and next one somebody talk about China, and next one some kid. Often video, in very know? subtle ways, like some somebody just like living their life in China, and they look they look happy and prosperous and free, mm-hmm. and you and you never. We'll see the stuff that shows people who are un, who don't who it shows how few rights you actually have and shows how bad things can be and yeah. you know you're not going to hear about de- democracy protests in Hong Kong on TikTok right that's probably no. not going to ever happen and if it if they get posted that, that would be an interesting challenge to TikTok to to see if they would allow that that sort of thing uh, that would show a lot. And I wonder if if they, you know, if they would outright ban them or if they would just hit a little button that makes them like, you know, don't ever show Less this. visible. Right. Exactly. You know, shadow banning, they call it. Yeah. So it's concerning. So, uh, again, it reinforces the reason why I don't have TikTok installed on my phone. I just. Yep. I just Same here. Same here. Plus the <laughs> addictive nature of it, which is uh, we'll get which is what our next story is about, which is uh, a. Uh, a new student movement that wants you to log off. And this is a story that showed up in various places, including New York times where uh, a bunch of Gen Z students, these are people who young people who have grown up immersed in the social media. They've never known a world without social media. Really. They're often were toddlers, you know, the, the top end of Gen Z were toddlers when Facebook came, you know, that, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And so they've always had, social media and it's been almost universally bad for them in, in one sense. Uh, they, the New York times has an interview with the founder of this movement. Her name is Emma Lemke. She's young in early twenties, I think. And she, she talks about joining Instagram when she was 12 and spending hours, six hours a day in, in scrolling through all of these videos. And I've looked at the stuff like the videos and the, and the photos and, uh, I don't use TikTok, but I've used Instagram Reels or Facebook Reels, and it depicts these entirely unrealistic lives. And you know, it only shows you the the, the prettiest and the most uh, uh, attractive, and you know, attractive in the mm-hmm. interesting lifestyle way, and all that sort of stuff. And it creates these unrealistic expectations of what life should be like and is like. And uh, they these young people are have this movement where they're t- trying to get pe- you know others of their generation to log off not to completely get rid of technology but to mitigate their use of it and unfortunately parents were not aware or were so caught up in this whole thing at when they were young that Mm -hmm. they let their kids have instagram accounts at 12 when you're not Mm -hmm. or facebook when you're not supposed to have one until you're 13 Right. Or I, even younger. I mean, I, I saw that with parents like, oh, yeah, my kid has this. I'm like, why? Yeah. So then and, and giving them phones and allowing them to have it in class. And so there's two generations here that, you know, these younger ones were enabled by I've a seen, lot of older so, their parents. I've seen situations where young people are expected to have smartphones in school to because the teachers, that's how the teachers, the only way they're assigning pro- projects or assigning mm-hmm. projects that require them to use a smartphone. Like this, this assumption that every kid has to have one and, and right. has to be on these apps. And, and part of it is the peer pressure. Some of these kids, well, why aren't you liking my stuff on Instagram? Well, I'm not on Instagram. Oh, what are you a weirdo? 
you know, and right. you're yeah. creating that pressure. Actually, I just saw that yesterday. I was up in Great Falls and drove past the high school, and there was a high school girl that was doing some kind of class project. It looked like, you know, science, you know, the old science project where you had to go out and pick leaves for trees, from <laughs> right, trees, right. you know. Mm-hmm. You had to go get like five or 10 different leaves, you know, to show the different types of trees in your neighborhood or whatever. Except she was, they had to use their phone, it appeared, because she had a, she had a worksheet in one hand and she was taking a picture of the tree from close up. Yeah. So I'm sure it was one of those where the idea was you had to go take a picture of the leaves of the tree instead of actually bringing in a leaf from the tree. And that's cool if you, if that's an optional part of it, but you know, the expectation that every kid has to have it and has to be on social media. I think, I think it's, I think it's the, frankly... The amount of social media that I consume, I think, is too much. Uh, mm-hmm. I've gotten too too much of it, and I need to really mm-hmm. start following some of this log off. And some of the stuff they suggest is really kind of cool. They talk about uh, the uh, the grayscale uh, trick, mm-hmm. which is to turn your phone grayscale, which you can do in accessibility settings. At least on the iPhone, it's in accessibility. Yeah. You can make your phone uh, grayscale. It makes it less interesting and attractive to just scroll through videos and photos if they're all in grayscale. I know some people who do that for Lent as a sort of penance. Mm. Uh, But also other uh, apps on your computer or on your phone that track how much time you're spending on things. You set up your own screen time limits, that sort of stuff. It's worthwhile because, gosh, I mean, I think we're all spending too much time on this stuff. Yeah. You know, it's good that these things are, I mean, technology is wonderful that we have so many things that are available to us. Like that girl who was probably doing the project, isn't there an app that if she holds, if she scans the leaf or or flower, it will tell you what it is, Mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing. Okay. I get that educational value, but it's later on when you just want to put it down somewhere or the poor kid who doesn't have a phone like that. There has to be options, but we're just expecting them all to have a phone or use an iPad, and it's just making them more screen slaves than anything else. I mean, I get yelled at for having a phone around, but, you know, part of my problem has been either work or sick relatives, and now one has been eliminated, so work is my only problem now. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. You know, I have to be available. By, by the way, I did look uh, in Android. There is the grayscale there as well. It's under color correction and accessibility settings. So okay. that can be done there as well. And it, it does help. I mean, it's it's not as yeah. they design these apps to be, you know, to catch your eye, to be vibrant, to, addictive. you know, addictive. Yeah. yeah. And this kind of can help with that. Yeah. Well, I, I'll, I we're doing confessions here. Father, forgive me for I've sinned. Uh, I have. Oh, I. I I pull my phone out at the dinner table, like especially toward the end of dinner as things are winding down. I pull it out. I start looking at Twitter, kind of scrolling through scene. I I look for things that are interesting to talk about with my wife mm-hmm. or the, the kids, you know. But I really shouldn't. I really just need to mm-hmm. put it away and you know have other conversations about things from memory, perhaps. I mean, that's not right. every meal, and it's not all the time. We have lots of good fun conversations, and we joke around and that sort of stuff. But I I. There are times when I do that and I really shouldn't. And it's, it's a yeah. problem. Yeah. Well, I, I have a, I, I've tried to make it a habit of when I go into the, one of my churches, I leave the phone in the car unless I have a specific reason to bring it in. Yeah. Cause otherwise I'll sit there as I'm waiting, you know, before mass, I'll be sitting there, you know, playing solitaire or surfing or, you know, reading or responding and it's just like yeah why do i not just leave this behind i don't need this with me while i'm in this church well, again unless there's something specific i need to do with the phone i'll tell you two things i use my phone for in church one i use ibrevery so i can actually mm-hmm. see the text on a bright screen as opposed to the the black on gray of the missalette <laughs> I can actually <laughs> find, you know, read the prayers, the, the readings usually. I, I I know the prayers, but the readings I'm usually reading. Uh, but I also take notes on the homily. No. Um, uh, Melanie and I, in our podcast, Raising the Bets, which I mentioned at the top of the show, uh, we we do, we'll often discuss this week's homily and, you know, the readings and what we heard in our homily. But it's hard, you know, I'm getting old. Uh, it's hard to remember. So I, I take notes in, in my, in, in drafts, my, the, my favorite note taking app and bring that back to, you know, our discussion and it, and mm-hmm. it actually helps me to pay attention to and to retain information as well. But I always feel awkward, you know, like I don't want people thinking I'm texting during, during the homily, you know, but yep. it's the world we live in. No, oh, I was accused of that once, but you know, as a musician, I have four score on my iPad and that's yeah. where the music is. So right. 
<laughs> exactly. Not playing here, folks. I'm playing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so speaking of, uh, uh, in my particular case of uh, being old and needing uh, help with technology, uh, this is uh, I don't know. That was that was a hard transition, but let's let's make it anyway. Lawmakers <laughs> offer a bill to regulate the volume of commercials on streaming services. Hallelujah! Thank Still? you. Yes. They're too loud. Oh, Still. So, <laughs> So there was a law passed in 2010 that directed the FCC to regulate broadcast commercials so that they could only be as loud as the regular show that that they're part of. And this has been a problem for for ages. I remember as a kid, you know, like we'd be watching the A-Team and then a commercial would come on and my mom would yell from the other room, turn that down. It's only the commercials, mom. You know, that sort of thing. And uh, and so they passed a law in 2010. To regulate it, and in fact, nothing changed. A lot of these channels were not didn't change anything. So this this new law, the the Calm Modernization Act, Calm stands for oh, what did it stand for? I get the up here the commercial commercial advertisement loudness mitigation. (laughs) It's just an office at Congress where they just think up acronyms. Like there must be. Oh yes. Anyway, for one thing, it puts teeth in those earlier regulations about broadcast, but then brings in streaming underneath it. So that streaming mm. services are going to have to adjust the volume of the ads. If you're watching a streaming service that has ads, uh, what do you, th- what do you think of this? Well, I, why I have YouTube TV. So, and that's considered a streaming service. So the commercials are horrible. I mean, yes. oh, they're, they're way up. That's why I said still they're way up again. And it figures it's my Senator. That's, you know, throwing this, uh, this bill out there. Right. But it, it's, it, you know what, they want our attention in the worst way. Pretty soon if they can't do that, and I think I've seen this on one streaming service, you're going to start getting little blurps at the bottom of your screen yeah. with commercials. Mm. Any way they can sell advertising space, they're doing it. So whether, you, whether it's by sound, whether it's by visual, it's it, what happened to getting rid of, you know, paying for something so you don't watch commercials. Right, exactly. Right. Yeah, that was the well, promise. And, mm-hmm. and, and they, they know how to make these commercials louder. They, they do that on purpose. That's not an accident. Mm-hmm. You know, because you know there are standards in broadcast for a TV show will be at this average volume, mm-hmm. this normalization of volume. And commercials right. are at this level, which is happens to be a little bit higher. Right. You know. Yeah, it it's it's intentional. It's it's to grab our attention. Frankly, if they just made the commercials better and had a little more variety, like I don't know how often mm-hmm. you guys like I, I try to avoid ad supported streaming just because it's mm-hmm. such so such a hassle that yep. they they it, I mean, it might be better now than it used to be. But where like you watch a show and it's the same ad every ten minutes, it like I changed. Please stop! You're driving me crazy. I want to turn that off. <laughs> like. Yeah. If I if I see that gecko commercial one more time, <laughs> <laughs> right? It's like you're making us the enemy. Like there are ways to advertise things and to support your your, your business that don't involve annoying the heck out of us. Like that's the right. problem. I you know I pay a little more to Hulu. I think it's Hulu to avoid the ads. You know, just the the ads are, the, and maybe that's the whole point. Maybe that that's mm-hmm. a their mm-hmm. their feature is they want to get more money out of us, right. but. Yeah. Well, yeah, because I pay Paramount Plus and Discovery Plus yeah. for no commercials because I can't, I can't take it. I can't either. Yeah, it's just too much. And it, or when they're badly cut in, like there's the obvious place for the commercial break, but they cut in like two seconds too early, so that when you come back, yeah. there's the last two seconds of that scene, and then the rest of it. it's like, oh, mm-hmm. come on, guys, you know? Yeah, Tubi does that. Yeah. YouTube is horrible for that, where it's because it's all AI. You know, mm-hmm. they just they yep. it, you, you know the producer says I'll allow this many commercials, and then right, and then it just slops them in wherever it can, and it it will be mid sentence. It'll it won't be mid you know mid sec- section of the com- of the video instead of like at a break or something like that. Yeah, transition. Yeah, it's. So uh, in that realm of a vein, um, I want to recommend a Safari extension for you Mac users out there called Vinegar. Um, I, actually, this should, I don't know if it was a pick of the week, but it should be one in the future. But uh, I'll talk about it more. But one of the things it does is it, 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 it you don't see ads, which is really nice. Mm. Uh, <laughs> okay. I'm a little more hardcore. I've got like, you know, uh, 
U block, you yes. know, U block origin. It's just like, no, I don't want to see anything. I also but- have U block um, in Safari too. So that might, I don't, I think it's vinegar that blocks it, but maybe it isn't. Maybe it's U block. Well, in any case, um, it doesn't help with uh, the apps like iOS apps or, you know, Android apps. The, you, the Google controls that. So you're going to see the ads one way or the other on those. So in any case. All right. So, uh, yeah, those are our headlines. Yeah, I, 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 and just, you know, the last word on that is I can't wait for the world in which we don't have to watch get loud ads anyway. Uh, <laughs> so uh, moving on to our picks of the week, Joanne, you're up first. What's your pick of the week? Well, I, I just love the hyperdrive products. <laughs> we can tell. <laughs> I do. <laughs> Because because they seem to have something for every usage. And this one was particular to my Mac Mini at work. Um, it took me about nine months, but yes, I've run out of ports. Mm. So I finally had to find something that would fit what my needs were at work. Now, remember, I work for the Catholic Church and a lot of our equipment is older than most no. things. So I was able to pick up on Hyperdrive, the ultimate 11 in one USB hub. Now, I picked this particular one for two reasons. One, it's on sale <laughs> and it's, it's 50 bucks, normally 129. Oh. But what I wanted was an array of ports that could be used because, for example, if I want to lend this to somebody else in the building and let's say they only have a regular monitor that doesn't have a HDMI, this has it. Right. So it has that old monitor. It has, um, so, and it does have your HDMI. It has the SD card reader, which I use a lot for video production. And the, sadly, Mac Mini M1 does not have Mm-hmm. that port anymore but right. it will probably, it, it, does the studio have it now yes it Dumb, does yeah. yeah see the the m1 the rig the one that came out first doesn't so i said okay this has more of what i need for this for this purpose but it still has like the gigabit um ethernet if i ever get it in my office mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. so it's versatile so and i still have it only has one um that it's, it's an older device it only has one USB C, but i still have you know, one more on the Mac mini. So I'm okay. So this was one of those devices where if you have an older machine, you don't, you know, you don't have some of these older ports, um, you know, it's going to be used in your, in your office by, uh, maybe by other people at other times. This is a good drive to have. When you buy the newer ones, you lose out on some of these older ports. So right now Mm -hmm. hyperdrive's having a sale and it's a good price. Yeah, it's a really good price. It connects via USB-C, so anything mm-hmm. you connect it to has to have a USB-C port. Right. But uh, it has gigabit Ethernet, HDMI, VGA, micro SD, uh-huh. regular SD, three USB-A ports, a USB-C power delivery port, so you could uh-huh. hook a laptop to that or it's something that draws power. I do. Yep. A <laughs> mini display port and an audio jack, so that's yeah, pretty good. Yeah, it, it, it's really a, it's, it's a good buy, and... Really, you do have more USB A's than anything else. Yes, mm-hmm. that's why you I have really a sixteen. Do. That's why I have a sixteen port USB A uh, hub <laughs> sitting right here. <laughs> I have a lot of USB A stuff. Uh-huh. I was gonna say I didn't even bother to put USB C in my system when I built it because everything I have is USB A. Yeah. Everything. Uh, I, I more things. I more things I'm getting are switching to USB C, so it's it's moving over. But yeah, I still have a lot of USB A. I I used up all my ports on my Mac Studio the day I uh, unboxed wow. it. I mean, I, I knew I was going to have a, have a need for extra things. So yeah, you're worse than I am. Oh, much, much. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Father Corey, what's your pick this week? So my pick is my current addiction. Um, you know, talking about social media addiction. Well, my my addiction is a game, and it's it's a game that's on uh, pre release or they call it early release on. Uh, Early, early access, that's what they call it on Steam. It's called Vampire Survivors. I describe it as Castlevania meets Gauntlet means a tower defense game meets Endless Runner. Basically, it's it's a game of you're you know you're the vampire killer going in to kill vampires, and you get wave after wave after wave of vampires. And I mean you're talking hundreds of them on the screen at any one time. Uh-huh. And you start out with you know just a simple weapon, the whip or a 
fireball or something like that. And then you, you, as you level up, you get more weapons. Of course, as you level up, more bad guys come at you. So you got to kind of figure out your weapons and everything to, um, to help keep ahead of them. And it's, it's a lot of fun. It's one of these games. And one of the reasons why I'm picking it and one reason why I enjoy it, it's one of those games. If you've got a half an hour, you can pick up and play it for a half an hour and say, okay, I'm good now. I'm good for a while. Yeah. It's not one of these that, you know, like the role playing games or the things that you have to constantly you're saving and it takes hours to get to the next save point and stuff like that. No, this is something you just pick it up, you play it, you have fun, you're done, you move on. And so it's, it's a blast. And the other, better part of it, it's only three dollars <laughs> it's cheap wow. but it is a really fun game it's just it's very simple you walk around and you don't even have to be sm- spamming the the fire button it auto fires you oh, just wow. move the character yeah. so all you have to do is you can use the keyboard controls you know up down left right buttons you can use control pad i've got a uh so from that uh ps1 mini that i'd bought and that remote that controller works great with this game and it just you walk around, you pick up treasures, you you get experience points, you kill creatures. It's fun. It's a lot of fun in different levels and everything. It, it gets it can get really involved, but it's a very simple game to play. It looks like it's a uh, eight bit graphics too. Uh, it's, yeah, it's it's well closer to sixteen, but it's yeah. the voxel style graphics. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. the pixel style graphics. Classic style. So, yeah, yeah, the more the classic style graphics. Which if you like that, it's great. If you don't, oh well. Yeah. It's only, it's only three bucks. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, it's only three bucks. It's fun. It's simple. It's it's yeah, almost it, like it, a, but, a phone game, you know, the a level of, of, you know, it, it cost. Yeah, it's very similar to that or like the old Flash games. And it's kind of got an interesting thing is you will only go a half an hour. Mm-hmm. It will kill it. Basically, it literally will kill your character at a half an hour, period. Death will come on and you're dead. That's it. <laughs> game over. So you're done. Yeah. Yeah, so it's it's really not meant to be something you'd sit here and play for hour and hour and hour on each on a new level. It's you got a half an hour and that's it. And of course you die earlier, you you know, game over. So yeah. cool. So my pick this week is something I I don't I can't believe I didn't pick before, but because this is one of the first things I install on any new Mac that I have, and it's called Default Folder X. And it you know, in, in your standard Mac operating system, you have open and save dialog boxes. When you open up a, a file or you're you're uh, saving a file, you see the same bo- uh, box that pops up and it shows you locations on your uh, hard drive and uh, the various uh, you know you can save things, you can uh, name the thing, and you can base. Uh, what's the other thing you can do? You can create a new folder in that in that space. Default folder X goes way beyond that, and what it does is. It adds all. It, it creates this frame around the the dialog box that has all these other tools. Things like um, you can navigate to particular standard locations, whether it's the library or your user folder. You can set up default. This is where it gets its name. Default folders per app. So if I'm in Word and I always save my documents in a particular folder, say do, the documents folder on my on my Mac. I can set that as a default folder, or if I have a work folder, if I want to see, always save it in Dropbox, or you can set up multiple defo- uh, folders that are favorites you can set. Uh, one of the things I really like is you if you have, if, when the open or save dialog box is open, you move the mouse outside the box and ho- and hover over an open window on the in the finder. If you click on it, it'll make that the open, the the active directory in the open or save dialog box. Um, hmm. I'm trying to think like there's so many ways that I use it. You can use it to set tags on folders. It's almost like you get every function in the finder. You can delete files from it. You can all kinds of stuff. You could put almost anything you do in the finder. You can do in default folder X and the name is kind of a giveaway. This has been around since before there was OS 10. This is the, I think they had it in OS nine days. This is a very, oh, wow. Very uh, venerable, shall we say, uh, piece of software. In fact, it's a it's a multi generation software. The developer, the original programmer, has now passed it on to his son, uh, to, oh, cool. <laughs> who's taking over development. <laughs> uh, so it's really kind of cool. And so uh, default folder X. Uh, I bought it so long ago. I have no idea how much it is uh, these days. Uh, thirty four ninety five, and you're making me spend my money again. <laughs> well, <Yeah. laughs> if you have setup, if you're a setup subscriber, it's also there. So oh, okay, uh, so uh, you know, go to setup and, and and do that. And again, that this is another reason why I finally decided to go with setup. I spend 
a certain amount a year on set app and it cover, but I get so much software from it that I use every day that it would, it covers more than covers the annual upgrade pricing that I would pay uh, regardless. But, uh, but yeah, uh, default folder X is, it w- if I use a Mac without it, I feel like I've got one hand time behind my back and that's, that's the <laughs> best endorsement you can get for anything. All right. So that should do it from us this time. We would love to hear what you think of anything we discussed this day. You can let us know by commenting on the show at sqpn.com slash technology or the StarQuest Facebook page at facebook.com slash StarQuest Media. You can send an email to technology at sqpn.com or visit the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord. We'd love to hear what you think of the show, but if you have questions, if you have topics you'd like us to cover, if you have uh, questions of, uh, you know, troubleshooting things that we could maybe help with, we would love to to, to hear any of those. Uh, we had a, a Discord user who's, I think I mentioned this before, who's a farmer who uses technology, and we're actually going to have him on uh, in the winter when he's not so busy, of course, to talk yeah, about exactly. uh, agricultural technology and, the you know, the tech that brings food to our table. So uh, that's... A, something that we've had in our uh, discord community so sqpn.com slash discord and you'll find links from our discussion and our picks of the week in our show notes at sqpn.com remember to like the secrets of tech wherever you find us on social media just don't scroll endlessly after you've liked it there you know, just put the phone down and log off uh, <laughs> we would love to thank uh, james for his research assistance in this episode and until next time joanne mercier thank you for joining me and sharing the secrets of technology thanks john Father Corey Stika, thank you as well. Thank you, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to The Secrets of Technology on StarQuest.